If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Ruth. Chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. 4, 1 through 12, continuing this study, uh, this this story of how God is taking all that's ruined and restoring it. Uh, This past uh, week, uh, 13 of us, 9 here from from this church, a pastor from Chile and one of his church members, and then two missionaries that we partner with, made a trip to Colombia to serve alongside some churches and a discipleship school there. Uh, We arrived back at 5.30 a.m. this morning. Uh, So I got one hour of sleep on the plane, and that was like one straight hour. It was like 10 minutes here, 10 there, just kind of dozed. So my wife uh, this morning said, I'm coming to the first service just to see how this plays out. Um, So just putting that before you now, uh, a little tired, but God did great, great things this past week. Uh, I just want to say thanks, special thanks to Pastor Drew uh, since Last week was a great message, then he prepped again uh, for this Sunday, just in case the flight was delayed. So, Pastor Drew, thank you, brother, for your sacrificial service uh, to our church in that way. And then so many uh, staff members uh, that just kind of picked up uh, the slack last week as we went and served there. A reminder that when you send people uh, from our church out to other places, you're a part of that. Uh, we, we are part of this church family, and a part of us is going out. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, every day I was encouraged to see uh, text messages come through of how you were praying for us. God is on the move in South America. One of the most encouraged, encouraging things to see was the churches and the discipleship school that we were partnering with had the same understanding that we do. That yeah, we want the gospel to go forth, absolutely, but we want to see people trained up. We want to see people disciple, to see them grow in their faith and then go out and reach their cities, their communities. And that is happening there. The Lord is on the move in Columbia. Thank you so much uh, for your prayers. Uh, as we served alongside a nutrition center, a couple of churches, uh, a soccer ministry that uh, they're reaching a community, they're going to plant a church there, the discipleship school. So many encouraging things that are happening there as we partner around the world to see the gospel go forth. As many of you know, I'm passionate about missions. Uh, I see myself as a missionary called to the Joshua and Burleson area. I always thought I would leave my homeland, uh, but God had other plans. Um, He has called me here, and and I want to uh, be responsible, be a good steward of what he has called me to do here, and to compel all of us to go and to reach our community and the nations for Jesus. I count it a privilege every time uh, I get to go and serve with some of our partner churches in different parts of the world. And and each and every time the Lord allows me to do that, um, it's almost like he he recenters me a bit. Uh, I'm reminded of what exactly it is he's called us to do. And this past week is, I got up early in the mornings to, to study and to work on the sermon. And then we served all throughout the day, usually till late. At night, I was reminded of, of the truth, the, the simple truth that I think we can take for granted. If you've been walking with Jesus for some time, I was, I was reminded of the truth of the gospel. That our Redeemer came to act on our behalf. I was reminded of the love of Christ. I was reminded that, that Jesus loves me, that my identity is first in him. I was reminded The Redeemer loved me enough to come after me. See, I think as church folk, certainly those of us that are on staff or in in leadership, we can get so caught up in in all that it means to to lead and to serve in the local church. We can miss, we can become numb to the, the beauty of the gospel. That the Redeemer acted on our behalf and said, hey, that one's mine. I, I love that one. That one's mine. And he saves us. He rescues us. I was reminded of the simple truth, the beautiful truth of the gospel and how it's active and how the Redeemer comes after us. In this book of Ruth, it paints this picture, this love story. But this love story is, is on two levels. Yeah, you got Ruth and Boaz. But it paints a picture of how the Redeemer 
loves his people. It's a, it's a picture of the story of restoration, the story of redemption. It paints this beautiful picture of the gospel. I want us to look at that this morning in chapter 4 of Ruth. If you would stand, let us jump into God's word. Chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz has spoken, came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and that belonged to Kilion and Malon. Also Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may, be, may not be cut off from among his brothers from the gate of this, his native place. You are my witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrath, renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offering the Lord will give you by this young woman. This is God's word. Let's pray. God, this morning we gather together. God, we thank you for moms. We thank you for the gift of moms. We thank you for this day to celebrate them. We thank you for how they have graced our lives for the sacrifices they have made. God, we thank you that we can gather here together on this Lord's Day, that we can look at your word. But I pray that as we look at it, we'd be reminded of the beauty of the gospel. God, I pray we'd be reminded that we were bought with a price. I pray that we'd be reminded that Christ came after us and if or when our world is unraveling, we'd be reminded that you have a plan and a purpose. Your hand is upon your people, and you are working. God, when all seems ruined, we know that you're the one that restores. God, this morning, teach us, convict us, comfort us, speak to us from your word. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. So to bring you all up to speed, uh, a lot of you know I've been here for every all four sermons so far. We have two more uh, left in this series through the book of Ruth. But if you missed one, to bring you up to speed, the book started out, there was a famine in the land of Judah. This is in the time of judges. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. So out of judgment, uh, a famine comes. This guy, Elimelech, uh, takes his family out of there to a pagan land called Moab, which he wasn't supposed to do. He dies there along with his two sons. He leaves his wife, Naomi, and the daughter-in-law is behind. One of them is named Ruth. Naomi finds out the famine has ended in Judah, so she decides to go back. Uh, Ruth commits to going with her, says, I'm going to follow you. Uh, I'm going to follow the God you follow. Uh, my God is going to be the God of, of Israel. And they travel back to the promised land. When they get there, Ruth gleans in the field 
to have something to eat to provide for her and Naomi. This field happens to be this guy named Boaz. And Boaz, it turns out, is one of their redeemers. And so Naomi and Naomi and Ruth come up with this plan to see if Boaz would act on their behalf, to, to act on their behalf to redeem them, to, to restore that which is ruined. So as we pick up today, Boaz is going through kind of the legal process to redeem them. He's going to confront this other brother. It's a tale really of, of two redeemers. We see the, these two redeemers in the text, and as we look at that, uh, what I want you to catch, what I want you to take away is this, this thought. Restoration comes through the willing sacrifice of our Redeemer, who in all selflessness acted on our behalf. So there's two Redeemers we see. The first one is a selfish and unwilling Redeemer. A, self, a selfish and unwilling Redeemer. So Israel's history... It's kind of wrapped up in this eye of this idea of redemption. So God's people are in slavery in Egypt. He, he rescues them. He redeems them uh, through the law. Really woven all in there is this idea of redemption. They were a people that were redeemed. They were rescued, and they were to be about that type of work. The the, the redeemed should be about redeeming. They should be agents of redemption. And so this idea of the kinsman redeemer was put into uh, the law as a way to care for the people of God. That they would replicate, that they would look like the redeemer, the God that they serve. So for the people of God, if one of their kinsmen are in slavery, then the kinsman redeemer is supposed to buy them out of it. So this kinsman idea is like kinfolk. Right? It's family. They're of the same clan. They're of the same people. So if someone is part of your people, whoever the redeemer is of that people, they're supposed to act on the people's behalf that are part of their crew, part of their clan, part of their family. So if someone was in slavery, Leviticus 25, 48, then after he is sold, he may be redeemed. One of his brothers may redeem him. So he falls on hard times, sells himself into slavery. The Redeemer's responsibility was to, to buy uh, them back out of that. Or if the, the family had fallen on a hard time, so they sold some, some land, it was the Redeemer's job to, to get that back. Leviticus 25, 25. If your brother becomes poor and sells property, sells part of his property, then his nearest Redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. And then another thing that's there, if there's a childless widow, the Redeemer is to redeem her, marry her, and then the offspring will carry on the line of the dead. The brother that died, the Redeemer will marry the wife, the child will then carry on the name of the dead father. Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10 is where we see this. It says, if brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside of the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that, this, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Verse 7. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Verse 8. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. It gets kind of Jerry Springer uh, up in here, but, but it's right here in the Word of God. Like You don't do what you're supposed to do. You're losing a sandal. You're getting spit on, and you're going home uh, just in full shame. All right, But that's what it says right here. His brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders. There's some other brothers watching this, so it's really humiliating. Give me that sandal, spit in the face, and she shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. So if, you've, if you name your home, 
If you got one of those nice houses where you gotta have a name for it, you don't wanna name it that, his sandal pulled off. That's not, that's not a good thing to, to name your house. This whole idea here is this thought called Goel. And it's over 20 times in the book of Ruth, this idea Goel, it's coming from this passage in Deuteronomy 25. The idea is that a redeemer takes that which is ruined and restores it. So for Ruth and Naomi, obviously if you're tracking with me, they fall in this category. They fall in this. The kinsman redeemer is to take Ruth, marry her, have a child, and then that child is going to carry on the name of Malon or Elimelech. That's key to understanding here. The redeemer is going to take on that which really isn't his, but he's going to take responsibility for it to restore it, then to carry on the name of the dead. And if the first redeemer doesn't act, they don't do what they're supposed to do. They get spit on. They, they lose a sandal. It's shameful. They're not taking uh, their obligation. But it's, it's signifying that the land, by losing the sandal, it's signifying that the land that they could have had isn't theirs. They're not standing upon it. So Boaz is going to go through this process that we see laid out in Deuteronomy 25. So he heads to the city gate. He goes to the city gate, and this is uh, not like you're just like rolling up into Old Town Joshua. It's like a gate. It's a place where people hung out. I don't know like where you're at with like history and technology, but this was before cell phones. This was before landlines. This is before bag phones, like way back, all right? So what you did, you just went to the city gate, and you stood there, and you just waited on whoever you needed to wait on that day. A lot of hanging out, a lot of standing around, a lot of impatience. Like, could we even deal with that? Like, now you just, you text someone, you just sit there and wait for that little bubble to pop up. And it pops up and they don't respond. Like, what are you doing? Like, imagine you're going to the city gate. You're just hanging out there waiting on the person you need to talk to. But this is what Boaz does. And it's not just a city gate like an entry point. It also operates kind of like a courtroom. Because the city officials, the, the, the elders would be there. Transactions would be made there. So Boaz is going to go there. As he mentioned in chapter 3, verse 12, he's going to go there. He's going to try to find the Redeemer and, and sit down and have a chat with him. Verses 2 through 4. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here, in the presence of the elders of my people. If you'll redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So look how Boaz sets this up. He's a godly brother, a man of character. He doesn't lie, but he certainly is intentional about how he lays this out. He lays out, hey, there's some land. Uh, it's yours. You should take it. He doesn't lie. He doesn't mislead him. He, he's thoughtful in his approach. He kind of surprises the guy. He's there hanging out by the, the city gate. He's got the elders there with him. The first thing that he does, he, he introduces the property. And the first redeemer says, I'll take it. Give me the land. Sounds good to me. It's a great deal. I'll take it. It'll increase my wealth. It'll increase my children's inheritance. I'm willing to redeem it. Yeah, let's go. But verses 5 and 6. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead and his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, so I cannot, for I cannot redeem it. So the redeemer that was willing is all of a sudden unwilling when it's going to cost him something. I'll take the land, I'll, I'll take the land, I'll increase my wealth, but I'm not about to take on other responsibilities. I'm not about to, to sacrifice. I'm not about to take anything away from, from my kids I'm not going to take any food off of my table to care for these two widows. I'll take the land, but no thanks on the Ruth. No thanks on the Naomi situation. I'm out. He's a number-crunching businessman. 
What's good for me? What helps the bottom line? How does this help my family, my people? That's his approach. He doesn't doesn't want the land because he doesn't want to take on the responsibility. He understands that when, when Ruth has a child, which is what is supposed to happen, that land will then go back to their people, to Elimelech, to Malon, is to carry on that name. So, so what would happen is he'd be paying the money, he'd be putting extra food on the table for these, these widows, and in the end there's going to be a child born, and this land is not even going to be his. So he's going to end up worse off than he was to begin with. He knows if he does this, his life is going to get complicated. There'll be more land to manage, more people to care for, more mouths to feed. And in the end, it does nothing for him. I think there's something for us to take note of here. And that is this. If you're going to truly follow God, if you're going to say, I'm all in, do with me what you will, your life is going to get more complicated. There's going to be complexities that come with that. But there's also going to be peace that comes from knowing you're doing what God called you to do. Peace from being faithful. For this guy, maybe his children are already grown. The inheritance is already set up. He's like, I'm not about to mess all that up and ruin any relationships with my own family. I'm out. And then in addition to that, let's not forget that Ruth is a Moabite. She's a Moabite. So so he's better off, he thinks, losing the sandal, getting spit in the face, than the shame that we brought on his family name by being with a Moabite. This is a man that that belongs to the people of God. Hear me, church. Like This is someone that was set apart by God, redeemed. His people rescued out of Egypt. This is supposed to be a follower of God. Someone that's benefited by redemption, by grace, by protection. But he says, nah, I'm not looking to mirror or to look like the God that I serve. I'm out. It's going to cost me too much. It's going to affect the bottom line. I don't want any part of it. Church, for you and me, let us realize, let us recognize that if, if we've been set apart, if we've been redeemed, we are to act in accordance with our Redeemer. The God that we claim to serve, we're supposed to be looking like him. Let this be a lesson for you and I. That if we are redeemed, we act as agents of redemption. We act as, as agents of restoration. When presented the opportunity to show the love of Christ, to to sacrifice, it's going to cost us something. We take the step forward. We say, yes. What we don't say, hear me, church, because this is what we often say. We're just like this first redeemer. We say, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? What am I getting out of it? Oh, it's too much. It's too much. You want me to walk across the, the restaurant and share the gospel? What if they make fun of me? Well, what's in it for me? What's at stake for me? Is people of God that have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus. We don't say what's in it for me. We say, God, what would you do with me? God, use me as you see fit. I'm yours. See, here in the text, this unnamed redeemer, he's all about the land. About helping his family, building up his name, building up his kingdom. It's about him, his wealth. But when there's a sacrifice to be made, he says, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think in a a book that has much to say about names. In recent weeks, we've seen this. It has much to say about names. Every person in this book, their name means something. But here in the Hebrew, this guy is pretty much old so-and-so. The brother doesn't even get named Old so-and-so, Mr. No-Name, because all he has on his mind is what's good for him. So brothers and sisters, let us not look like the first person in this text because he's a selfish and unwilling redeemer. 
Secondly, we see a selfless and willing redeemer, a selfless and willing redeemer. So there's this idea of redeeming people that find themselves in the worst situations. We see that that laid out in the law. And it's not about land, it's about love. It's not about wealth, it's about love. The land is God's anyways. The money is God's anyway. The crop, it's all God's. It's all his. It's all his. But out of love for his people, he puts in place that this plan, that this law, that this way to, to live out the love that he has showed for them, that they would be agents of redemption, that they should love one another as a result of the God they serve and what he has done for them, that it's not what's in it for me, it's what would God have me to do. The very spirit of the law that we see here, it's a law of sacrifice. It's a law of selflessness. The, the unnamed redeemer, Mr. So-and-so, he missed the memo. But Boaz didn't, verses 8 through 10. So when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon, also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. So the selfless, then willing redeemer is willing to pay the price for the good of someone else. Boaz, a stand-up guy, a man of character, a man of integrity. He's upright. He's willing to do what God has called him to do, even if it cost him much. Over and over again throughout this book, we've seen Boaz as this type of guy. He's a man of godly character. He steps in when, when someone else won't, no matter what the cost is. And not only does he do what is right, he does it in the right way. The elders are there, the witnesses are there, they, they see this taking place. He says, you are my witnesses on this day. Uh, reminding us of, of back in chapter 3, verse 13, he said he would resolve the matter that day. And in response to this, there's this threefold blessing from the people that are hearing this, the witnesses. Verses 11 and 12. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. Listen to this. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. So there's one prayer, one blessing. Secondly, may you act worthily in Ephrath and Renown in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, from Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So I think there's three blessings that come out of this text. Their, their response is this. They ask that the Lord would make Ruth like Rachel and Leah, the wives of Jacob, where the 12 tribes of Israel come from. Leah would have been a distant ancestor of Naomi and Boaz. And their, their prayer is, Make Ruth like Leah and Rachel. Bless her in that way. So there's the first prayer, the first blessing. Then secondly, the next is a prayer for Boaz. That he would prosper. That he would be seen as a man of sacrifice, of selflessness in his land of Bethlehem, of Judah. And then the last prayer is this prayer really for the whole family. May the house be like Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. But because she, if you know the story, she was like Ruth. She was a widow. But she went about it in a deceptive way. She had to, to, to step in when she thought God wasn't going to. While Ruth, on the other hand, she sacrificially serves. She sacrificially lays down her own life, trusting the Lord for the outcome. So through Boaz's willingness to redeem Ruth, that these prayers are all going to be answered. It's all going to come to pass. Ruth 
will be this key figure in redemptive history. She will become a mom, and God will use her in a mighty way. Bethlehem, this little town, great things will happen there just as they pray. In a time where there's no king, when everyone's doing what's right in their own eye, the people aren't even asking for a king. They don't even know what to, to ask for. The king will come through the line of Boaz. Through the offspring of Boaz and Ruth, God's plan of redemption and restoration would come. And it's in a much greater way than Naomi or, or Boaz or, or Ruth or any of the witnesses this day could ever comprehend in verse 12, there's this word offspring. If you're writing in your Bible, I would have you circle it or make a note of this. Verse 12, offspring. That's the same word used for seed. Offspring, seed. For the people of God, they should understand that all the way back in the beginning when the fall happened, when sin entered the world, but in Genesis chapter 3, we see this, this first gospel, that there's a plan of redemption, that that which was ruined by sin will be restored through this offspring, that this seed, the, the first gospel in Genesis chapter 3. The people were awaiting this offspring that would crush the head of Satan. The plan of redemption and restoration will be fulfilled through a bunch of unlikely people along the way. When you think about the Old Testament, you think about just this book that we're in, you think about the, the characters and what we know about them and how we have seen them and how they're interacting with one another, just an unlikely cast of characters. But through that, this thread of redemption, this thread of restoration, Leading up to the most unlikely of people, a virgin girl. A virgin girl that would have a child. And through her would come the Redeemer, this offspring, that this seed that verse 12 is pointing to, that this Redeemer would come to live a sinless life, to, to die the death that, that we deserve, to overcome the grave, to be Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, who would willingly take all that was ruined upon himself to restore it. Church, he came after us. Church, he, he stood at the proverbial city gate and said, that one's mine. That one's mine. I'm redeeming that one. That one belongs to me. He stood there on our behalf. He says, you belong to me. He came after us, church. Uh, we got to clearly see the gospel. The gospel is that what you brought to your salvation is your sin. And that was it. But Jesus came after you. He said, it's mine. Uh, on our behalf, he initiated this relationship with us. He says, I'm redeeming them. Church family, he, he takes outsiders and brings them to the inside. Just like Boaz redeeming Ruth, taking an outsider, a, a Moabite from a pagan land and bringing her into, our Savior redeems us through the finished work on the cross. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, repent and believe and be restored through his work. A reminder for us from this text that, text that restoration comes through the willing sacrifice of our Redeemer who in all selflessness acted on our behalf. If you don't know Christ, repent and believe. If you do, I want to remind you that you were bought with a price I want to remind you that our Savior came after you. You were, you were bought with his blood. In love, he came after you. He pursued you. He said, that was mine. I'm redeeming that one. He came after you. I want to remind you, church, that when your world's crumbling down, when you don't understand what's going on, he has a plan and a purpose. He's working in your life. He uses his people We've been marching through the book of Ruth. 
We're about to be through the, the fifth sermon here, but this is years, church. This is years. We just marched through this. You're not understanding the, the amount of time. Think of the wreckage. Think of the lostness. Think of the, the lack of hope. But God is working a plan together for his people. So, so church member, those that know Christ, if you're here this morning, be reminded that you were bought with a price that you were sought after by the king and he is working in your life even when you can't see it. If you've been redeemed, he's working in in your life. I'm afraid that sometimes we lose that wonder. If you've been walking with the Lord for some time, I want you to go back to that day. That day that you had ears to hear, that it made sense. That you're like, Jesus called me to to himself. I've been saved. Go back to that day. Remember how you felt when you first understood the gospel, that Christ loved you, that he came after you, that he redeemed you. Take yourself back to that day. It's very important that we grow in our theology, that we are disciples, that we learn more of Jesus, that we live it out, but we never forget that Jesus died for us. The beauty, the simple beauty of the gospel. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, my entire theology can be summed up in four words. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Church, I don't know about you, but this past week, as I got up early each day, prayed, read, studied, wrote, edited over and over and over again, I was reminded of the truth of this text that the Redeemer comes after his own. And then as we served in Columbia alongside brothers and sisters there, we evangelized in the city and saw one come to Christ. As we went out there, I was reminded of the beauty of the gospel. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can get so caught up in just the day-to-day. I can get so caught up in just needing to, to know more, to, to grow in the word, which is good, but I can miss the beauty of the gospel. Church, may we never forget it. May we live on fire for Jesus like we did the day we were redeemed. When things get tough, when we remember this truth that Christ died for us, we're reminded to die to ourself, to live sacrificially, and to serve others no matter the cost. Amen. Let's pray.